Namaste. Well, we've been talking quite a bit about the individual verses in the Katupanishad, but we haven't really uh, stepped back and taken a look at the whole thing, or at least selected sections and their meaning, and especially their application. There's a tendency when trying to understand scripture of getting too intellectual. And this leads to a kind of mood of detached, dry mental speculation. Now, it might seem that the verses in the scriptures kind of demand that, but actually they don't. And this is due to a mistranslation. When we hear the word intellect, we tend to think of something mental up in the head. But the word that's usually translated intellect or intelligence is buddhi. Buddhi actually means the intelligence in the heart, the intention. See, Sanskrit and uh, English are very different in their approach to the structure of the human being, uh, whereas we think intelligence is something like mind. Actually, it's not. Intelligence is higher than mind. Check out this verse. The sense objects are higher than the senses, and the mind is higher than the sense objects. But the intellect is higher than the mind, and the great soul is higher than the intellect. So not only is there a distinction made between mind and intelligence, but the intelligence is higher than the mind. Why is that? because the intelligence directs the mind. It sets goals for the mind. It aims the mind at a specific subject, a specific question. So intellect is not something divorced from emotion. In fact, quite the opposite, because we are emotional beings at the core. The subject of rasa, which is transcendental emotion, relationship with God, comes up again and again in the scriptures. There is no relationship with God without rasa. There is a rasa called neutrality, but even that is a feeling of adoration, of awe and reverence from afar. It's not considered a very important rasa. <laughs> The more uh, intimate rasas are considered much better. They are not only servitorship, but friendship. Not only parenthood or caretaking, but conjugal love, romance. So how is it that we got it so wrong that when you see people discussing spiritual topics here on YouTube or uh, you know, in articles and books and so on. They are so cold, dry, intellectual. Intellectual is not the use of intellect. Intellectual means abstract. It means uh, divorced from a warm, earthy, grounded sense of the practical application of the scriptures. So when the Upanishad speaks of meditation, it does so in the context of the heart. He is hidden in all beings, and hence he does not appear as the self of all. But he is seen through appointed and fine intellect by the seers of subtle things. And later on, he who sees the firstborn, Hiranyagarbha, born before the five elements from consciousness, Brahman, as existing in the cavity of the heart, having entered in the midst of body and senses, sees this very aforesaid Brahman. 
And again, in the next verse, comprising all deities, who takes birth as Hiranyagarbha, who is manifested in association with the elements, and who is seated in the cavity of the heart, sees that very Brahman. So, if we're going to see Brahman with our pointed and fine intellect, huh? where is he? Not in the head, but in the heart. That's why we have always said that a path without heart cannot be a real path. That is why these commercial presenters who want to be so intellectual are missing the point. Oh, well, they're also, by the way, missing getting realized because they think they can think their way to self-realization, and that is not so. We have long known the friend in the heart. The friend in the heart is Brahman, of course. The self, the real self. I don't like the phrase higher self because it implies that the lower self, the individuated personality, the empirical self is real. And it's not. It would be better to say the real self as opposed to the false self of ego, individuality, and so on. That doesn't mean that the real self is devoid of relationship or, or we can't have a relationship with the real self. We can, even as a conditioned living entity, even as a separate individual, we can approach the self in the heart and have a relationship. Now, there are many very sophisticated verses. The discriminating man should merge the organ of speech into the mind. He should merge that mind into the intelligent self. He should merge the intelligent self into the great soul. He should merge the great soul into the peaceful self. Now, this is very analytical. But actually, the practice of it is much more grounded in emotion and attitude and relationship. So how does that work? huh? By now, I mean, most of the people who don't practice these things have probably left eight minutes into the video, halfway through. So now we give the real secrets. The secret is focusing on the heart. The heart is where the Supreme lives. And we'll see in the next few verses that we cover in this Upanishad, he is described as the size of a thumb seated in the heart, not in the brain. <laughs> That's a ridiculous idea because that would infer that the Supreme, the being of Brahman is imagination. And it's not. Mind is imagination. Intellect is intention. And that includes emotion, rasa, the relationship with the Supreme. So what does that mean practically? How do you apply this? How do you get the result, which is seeing the Supreme Self in the heart? Well, first you have to concentrate on the heart using your ordinary senses. Just sit quietly in a silent place where there's no possibility of being disturbed. Turn the attention inward and focus on the heart. Feel the heart beating. Feel the energy, more importantly, moving from the heart to the whole rest of the body. Feel the circulation of life force, prana, through the heart, uh, the breath, the rest of the body, and so on. And just stay there. Don't let the mind wander. Don't let it jump all over the universe. 
This is called in Bhagavad Gita, Vyavasayatmika Buddhi, means fixed intelligence. You have to fix the intelligence on the self. Then slowly, slowly, spontaneously, without effort, all these higher states will manifest and you will experience them through time, not through effort. Holding the mind by force on the heart. No, that's not going to work. Effort is very inefficient because it strengthens the ego. This is why the yogic path is ultimately a dead end. It tries to attain samadhi, one-pointed concentration on the transcendental by means of will. And will is of the mind. Will is of the ego. Intention and insight are of the intelligence. And that effortlessly leads to transcendental realizations. So how do we do that? Huh? Uh, everybody is going to, I know, uh, every time I publish a video like this, somebody's going to post a comment, but how do we do that? <laughs> Through knowledge. Knowledge leads to insight. See, if we, first of all, concentrate on the heart with our ordinary senses, then the sense objects, earth, water, fire, air, and space, along with the mind, are going to be focused there too. And gradually we'll become aware of how the whole machine of the body is working, and then we'll transcend it. We'll realize that we are intelligence alone. And that intelligence gradually leads back to its source, back to its cause, which is consciousness and Brahman. Because Brahman is nothing but consciousness. Now, how do you do that? You don't do it. <laughs> what you do is you focus on the heart, allow the mind to come to rest. Allow the mind, not force it but allow it, because you know, this is the ultimate meditation. If you know this, if you have the insight that this is true, you don't need to force the mind. The mind is going to be very interested. Oh, this is the meditation that leads to cessation of suffering? Oh yeah, let me get some of this. So the mind becomes peaceful, focused on the heart, then slowly, slowly, the intelligence becomes engaged beyond the intelligence, the higher spiritual self, and so on. All becomes clear. It doesn't happen through effort. It happens through knowledge and insight and time, revealing the ultimate truth. And this is the secret of all meditation, that it's not effort. There might be a little effort in the beginning just to set up the conditions, you know, concentrating the senses on the heart and so on. But that surely gives way to direct insight into the nature of being, existence, and consciousness. And then enlightenment comes, just like the grass grows in the springtime, without doing anything because that is the natural path leading to enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.